Okay, and now I am so delighted to introduce to you our keynote speaker for the evening. You are all familiar with him, I'm sure, Dr. Patrick Soon Cheong. He's one of the preeminent scientific and medical minds in the world today. Dr. Cheong has lent vision, voice, and action to the power of convergence, applying limit limitless potential of collaborative science and technology on a personal level. And he happens to be the world's most financially successful biotech entrepreneur, uh, having managed the virtually impossible feat of building not one, but two multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical firms simultaneously. Talk about an overachiever. What's even more inspiring, Dr. Soon Xiang has contributed over $200 million in donations and pledges to Los Angeles area hospitals. Um, it's kind of amazing that everything the guy touches seems to turn to gold, except for the Lakers, but you know. <laughs> Sorry! <laughs> Sorry, I'm a Clipper fan, okay. Please, <laughs> please welcome to the stage, Dr. Patrick Soon Xiong. <laughs> Well, next time you need floor seats in the playoffs. <laughs> now, thank you so much for uh, the honor of my being here. Um, I don't know, this is apparently billed as a keynote address, and I'm not sure that there's any keynote, but maybe I think what I want to do is just thank the, uh, the association for the opportunity for me to talk. And I saw that your um, title there is about healthcare and changes in the workplace. And uh, by the way, I'm sort of surprised that Mark Ridley Thomas is not here. I'm going to get, get at him because um, we opened the, we're about to open the um, Martin Luther King Hospital together. And as a reward, <laughs> and, and most of the credit of that goes to Mark. So, and as a reward, he gave me a T-shirt that says, a brother from another mother. So, <laughs> so. so so I hope uh, if anybody you see him, you can rag him for not being here. He should be here. Um, not for me, but for, the, for, for this Asian Business Association. Um, you know, I think, as I said, I, it, it tr truly is, and I hear about your grandfather, Lisa, but about the idea of Asians um, making an impact um, in this nation and in this city, in this country. And we really do, and I am very proud. Um, I, I was asked to give an address at the ACG Business Conference last week, and, and it was uh, really not an address a Q&A session, and says, well, wh what are you? Where did you come from? So, well, yeah, my parents were born in China, so I'm Asian. I was born in South Africa, so I'm African, and I'm now a full American citizen, so I'm a, I suppose I'm an Asian African American. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I suppose that's called triple A. Uh, uh, so I think, you know, it has been a blessing for me as, as, as an Asian coming into this country. I, I, I grew up in apartheid, so I think that seared a lot of uh, my uh, upbringing. My, my father was actually a village doctor in China, and um, what he did was he had Chinese medicines, and I'm sure some of you grew up with those horrible tasting, horrible smelling uh, um, concoctions. I would sit literally with him as he was making these concoctions and he would be treating all the Chinese families uh, in, in, my, in, in our home city in, in South Africa. So I, I was grown up, I grew up in this field, in this world of, of, of apartheid and understood very much the uh, uh, um, difficulties of being downtrodden and having very little opportunity but with persistence you can do really anything and this country, as, as I said, it is the American dream. Um, I, I left the university not to build a business. I actually left the university to pursue a dream of, of uh, trying to develop a drug that um, nobody believed, um, frankly, should even have been developed. And, I, and I, one of the um, messages I want to give here is really don't let anybody um, push you away from not only your persistence, if you really believe in yourself and believe that what you're doing is the right thing, it'll work. So just by virtue of the example, um, and I, you know, it's, things are obvious when you sort of speak it after the fact, and it's difficult to actually overcome dogma. 
And we're going to go through this very same thing now. If I said to all of you um, that cancer is whenever you have anybody or a friend, a loved one with cancer, whether the patient has breast cancer, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, melanoma, regardless of the cancer type, they all lose weight. So if you think, well, there's a ubiquitous event, everybody loses weight, why is that? And it turns out in 1990, I was part of the NASA space shuttle program at JPL, and we were putting um, um, our stem cells in there. And one of the reasons our cells couldn't survive is it didn't have a protein called albumin. And it also turns out by luck, uh, Johnson Space Station was sending up albumin in the space shuttle which is a protein in your blood. And I started reading about that, and it turns out that one of the earliest diagnoses of cancer is a loss of albumin. And I said, oh my God, this is what's happening. That's why everybody loses weight. So what if we took this albumin from your human blood and made a protein nanoparticle and put rat poison inside it, and instead of starving the tumor, feed the tumor, and feed it basically this protein particle from your blood? Now, in retrospect, that sounds pretty logical, <laughs> except that uh, a big pharma company like Genentech was about to release a drug called Avastin, which became a multi-billion dollar drug where you said starve the tumor. So here I was, this little scientist saying feed the tumor, and here's this big company saying starve the tumor. And one of the greatest fears I had was the science who showed, at least to me, that if you starve the tumor, you would actually cause metastasis. So here I was in 1992 trying to convince the world that we should create uh, a nanoparticle of human blood and feed all, um, all tumors. And it became very difficult because nobody believed that that was even possible to manufacture and secondly, even difficult to believe that that would work. So cut long story short, through persistence, um, we built a pharmaceutical company that got the drug approved for breast cancer. I raised a huge amount of money to actually do seven phase three trials. This is unheard of, a company that was making very little money because I wanted to prove that it not only would work in breast cancer, it would work in lung cancer, it would work in pancreatic cancer, it would work in melanoma. And fast forward today, it got approved for breast cancer. It's got approved in lung cancer. And last week, it got approved in pancreatic cancer and soon hopefully be proven melanoma. So, <laughs> so thank you very much. But I, if, that, if that was the story, I'd be satisfied and I'd go play basketball and get the Lakers up. And <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's not the end of the story, unfortunately. What I started discovering in 2005, that as soon as you give a drug like a Braxane, and actually you wipe out metastasis, you actually spawn a whole new slew of micrometastasis. You spawn actually the awakening of the cancer stem cell. And we found a way not only to identify that, but to wipe that out. So now I can tell you that we now have patients that are five years out who have had metastasis throughout the body from pancreatic cancer completely free of disease. We now have patients with pancreatic, metastatic pancreatic cancer at 87% one-year survival. That data is not yet out. This will be coming out publicly soon. And the question is why? Why is it that there are patients with lung cancer and brain cancer and pancreatic cancer that are now are some are free of this disease? And the, and the answer really boils down to there's a molecular signature in every one of us uh, that can be identified called the genome and the proteome that could tell uh, whether what cancer and what drug the patient should be on. What's more exciting, we've now discovered that these cells from your tissue actually leak out into the blood and now we can for the first time measure the circulating cancer stem cell or the, or, or the tumor cells in the blood, which means you can now treat and monitor this as if you're monitoring diabetes which means we have to actually create a system to interrogate this molecular profile in real time. Now here's the problem. If we did 10,000 patients 
uh, to monitor them a day when there's 13 million cancer survivors, that's the math, that's 30 times the download of Facebook per day. That's eight times the equivalent of um, Netflix library per day. So I started approaching the White House and, 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 and Washington to try and get the country to actually create a infrastructure, a highway, a freeway to move this kind of data so that doctors and patients could have this information available in real time. So that's what I've been doing since 2008, unfortunately, uh, with very little success because, again, like the nanoparticle, nobody could believe that you could interrogate and identify cancer and put uh, aside the fear of cancer forever um, if in fact you could have this information at your fingertips. So to cut long story short, we went ahead and built uh, this national lambda rail, this fiber infrastructure, 12,000 miles of fiber across the country. We've now interconnected 200 hospitals with vital signs that's actually going into the cloud. Uh, we've built a, a decision support tool that is now touched 50% for the oncologists. And we'll be launching uh, next year this information highway that not only will be able to decide what drug the patient should be on, but be able to measure the outcomes for this patient for life. And our job now is not to only bring this through California, bring it through the country, and actually export this to the rest of the world. So imagine uh, America then could be the export as a part of foreign policy of incredible knowledge that will benefit all of mankind. So that's what we're about to do. But we still have a big challenge because we have, I believe, third world healthcare in a very, very wealthy nation. I was just at the, <clears throat> and you know, South Central LA, and you look at places like um, the poor, and, and uh, one of the other challenges is we should not have medical apartheid. I came from the country of apartheid, we should not have medical apartheid in this country. And I just came back from uh, a visit which was one of the most heartwarming visits, but also one of the heart wrenching visits of the Navajo Nation. So here we have in Arizona the largest urban population of, of, of the um, Native American population and completely the highest instance of cancer, diabetes, suicide. And we abandoned these people yet again. So I think we have um, an obligation um, and this is how the Asian community can all gather together to actually put our resources to, ha to help not only these people but ourselves. So again, thank you for um, having me here to give you my little tirade, I suppose, of what I think uh, we need to actually do to transform healthcare. Uh, but that's going to be at least my, my challenge for the next four or five years. Thank you so much.